Hey everyone! Uh, this is not going to be one of my usual animated videos. This video is actually going to be a longer story video from when I ran a superhero game. The reason is that some people have messaged me after I did the Deadlands story and the Call of Cthulhu story, and they were interested in having me tell other stories from some of the other games that I've ran. And unfortunately, you know, with the animated videos, you can't really go into too much detail and they have to be pretty short. Uh, I'm gonna do this one. This one is probably not gonna be a regular thing, but you know, on occasion I'll make kind of these longer videos because I think some people are interested in them. So first getting into that, I actually have ran quite a few superhero games. Uh, when I was talking in the interview, one of the questions which came up was like, what kind of games do you play and what other games do you run? Because I had brought up that I ran Fantasy Age. What I'm going to do is I'm actually just going to be putting up a list. And this is, the first list is going to be the games that I play the most. And then the second list is going to be games that I have run the most as a GM. So the first list, the games that I played the most, starting off at the top of the list, most played games, for me, first is D&D 5th Edition, top of the list. I've been playing it a little bit since it came out. Like, I've had a weekly group, and it's just, you know, you get all these different sessions in, and then everyone wants to run it, so I get to play it quite a bit. Then, second on the list is Star Wars Edge of the Empire. Star Wars Edge of the Empire, I have a friend who loves, loves, loves that game, loves running it, loves playing in it, so... I've, I've played quite a bit of it. It's, it is, once again, it's my second most played uh, tabletop RPG. Then you've got uh, third is D&D 4th Edition, which I've played a lot of. Uh, I was playing it for about two years or so. Um, and then following that is Dresden Files, Pokemon, and Pathfinder. Those ones I've played a little bit, but not too much. You know, you're talking about like five games, three games, four games, something around there. Also, I have tried playing in Game of Thrones, or a Song of Ice and Fire RPG, but it's that thing where it's, it's always very difficult to run, and it has very complex rules. Usually the group kind of defaults back to playing D&D 5th Edition, and, you know, it's with schedules, so I haven't really had a chance to play that, but it's like I've made characters, and we've done kind of background work for Game of Thrones. Now... Here's the other list is these are the games that I have run from the most common to the least. And let me tell you right now, this is going to get weird. Top of the list for me is Call of Cthulhu. I have run a ton of Call of Cthulhu. It was the first RPG that I got into running. And the reason why is because it was kind of the opposite of D&D. And a lot of people liked playing it as kind of a refreshing change of pace from from Dungeons and Dragons. And then it's just, it, it was the first one I ran. And so it was like the fallback where, hey, what do you guys want to play? Like, let's play Call of Cthulhu. It's like, okay. So I ran that quite a bit. Then second place is Icons, which is a superhero RPG. Very simple, very easy to get into. Then after that is Fantasy Age, Seventh Sea, Mage the Ascension, Legend of the Five Rings, Dread, and this might be a little surprising coming in at 8th place, D&D 4th Edition, Pathfinder, and then D&D 5th Edition. Even if I combine those three as to just D&D, &D, um, I've still ran Mage of the Ascension more often than I have run D&D. &D. Then at the bottom of the list, I ran one session of Star Wars, D20, Munes and Masterminds, Deadlands, and Hyperlanes. And then there's some notable mentions, like I ran a little bit of GURPS, uh, Traveler, Barbarians of Lemuria, but those don't, those didn't go over that well. Some of them I got through part of a session, some of them we got through like session zero, and that was it. Anyway, I've been particularly interested in superhero RPGs, and I've read a lot of those books because they're always so fascinating to me how they do the numbers and how they handle superhero traits. And the reason why is because it's like, let's say you're playing the D20 system and someone fires a gun and one of the players wants to catch a bullet. Like, what's the dex check to catch the bullet? You know, 37, 58, 109, you know, and it's the the problem is that in real life or in in D D, you usually have some kind of the numbers are kind of grounded because you say, hmm, this is a hard check for a normal person. This is an easy check for a normal person. You have some kind of like standard or some something to measure it against. But a lot of times in superhero RPGs, you're talking about these fantastical abilities and these strange things that people can do, and it's hard to really put a number to them. Like, 
what's the agility roll to run at superhuman speeds? You know, stuff like that. Um, and so every RPG has a different way that they handle those those numbers, and it's interesting to go through the different books and read them and see how they differ. But here's the thing, is a lot of times players love superhero games because they let you do a lot of the cool stuff that in other games would be banned, you know, in D&D. Like, uh, in superhero games, a lot of them let you take, like, immortality, you know, resistance to damage. Um, you know, you can lift a tank, telekinesis, you know, a lot of these incredibly powerful abilities uh, that would be, you know, game-breaking in other systems. So this particular game, I was running Icons. So the pitch I gave to the players was that this was a superhero game set in a dystopian sci-fi futuristic setting. Basically, the concept for the world was it was an alternate timeline to the Avengers 2. In the past, you had a golden era of superheroes where there are hundreds of these heroes running around, most of them working for the government, keeping the peace. Eventually, there was one supervillain who rose to power, who was this evil AI. Basically, think... Ultron, who viewed humanity as a plague and wanted to restart everything and initiate his own new era for the world. In my universe, he was called Omnius. So what happens is when Omnius rises to power, you have this big climactic battle, the showdown that happens between these evil AI led by Omnius versus the forces of good and the heroes. And the heroes lost. You know, Omnius took over, crushed his enemies, instituted his world government, did a purge with like nuclear weapons and bio warfare and he took over and he won. So now we're playing it's 30 years after the end of the war and the planet's been devastated by bio warfare and radiation. It's a giant wasteland out out there with rolling dunes, mountains. You have these aberrations and mutants. You've got wastelanders who go around and pillage and loot people for supplies and uh, materials, and they fight other gangs. And then you have these settlements, these human cities, that are tightly controlled by Omnius and the technocracy. Basically, the people who live in these cities, they're sheep. They're just cattle to the technocracy. They move people around where they want. They evaluate people. They determine, okay, you're going to be working here. You're going to be working there. You have no freedom. If they determine people to be quote-unquote troublemakers or not worth their time or not an asset, then they are disposed of. And there's a lot of propaganda because the technocracy is trying to say like, oh, humans are the cause of all this war and strife and all these problems in the world, and here we are, the technocracy, just trying to ensure order. Then you have Omnius, and Omnius at this time is basically untouchable. He's this evil overlord, he controls everything. At the onset of the campaign, there's really nothing you can do against him. He's just too powerful. Like, maybe late campaign, something might happen, but not right now. Some of my players have actually compared this particular setting to something like Star Wars A New Hope, where you have the Empire, they take over, they destroy the Jedi. The Jedi in the past were, you know, peacekeepers and stuff, but then they got crushed. Now you have this reverse propaganda against the Jedi, and that's a pretty fair comparison. I think it's, I think it's pretty similar, uh, the settings. One of the things I really liked about this particular setting, and I didn't realize it when I was first kind of developing it, is that it's it's one of those settings where, like, everything is trying to kill you. Everything wants you dead. You go out into the waste, the wastelanders are trying to kill you. If you're in the settlement, the technocracy is trying to kill you. You know, you got these mutants. And it's one of the great things about the setting is that the players can kind of go anywhere where they want, and they will always find a thing to do. There's always going to be some a-hole who needs to be taken down or some problem that needs to be solved. So it, it was that was actually one of the huge advantages of it because I, I've played in other games which are like modern day settings or Call of Cthulhu. And one of the major issues with, with those kind of settings is that you can't just like drive out to a random town and then find something to do. It's um, it, the the concept of those settings is that these sorts of problems are unique to a specific area or that they're rare. Whereas in the technocracy setting, there are problems everywhere. Everywhere there's problems, so you don't have to look very far to to find something to fix. Oh, also one other thing I have to clarify: uh, you might recognize both of the names, the technocracy and Omnius. I lifted both of those names from other works. 
Technocracy is originally from Mage the Ascension RPG game. What the technocracy was is it was a union of these mages that controlled technology. And so they were called the technocracy or the technocratic union because they controlled technology, information, the media, stuff like that. This particular technocracy is different because they're literally just technology that controls people. It's a, it's a government owned by the, the technology. And I, I like the name, so that's why I used it. Uh, then Omnius. Omnius is actually from Dune. And once again, it's another evil overlord computer. I just, I really liked the name. Uh, I don't really know that much about Omnius from Dune, so I don't, you know, don't... It's not like, oh, I'm trying to pour it over the character. I'm just, I really like the name, Omnius. I think it's, it's an interesting name, so that's why he went by the name of Omnius. So, let's go down the list of players. I had three people... In icons, you can make whatever kind of a hero you want. There's a lot of flexibility in the system. Uh, the only problem is usually running out of points. So you could make something like a low-level Goku who fights using Kung Fu and throws energy blasts, but you probably wouldn't be able to punch the planet in half because that would just take too many points. All of the players made a character based on a particular archetype or some, someone from a work of fiction. And this is something that I ran this game quite a bit, and you always see that happen where people usually don't want to play like Joe Strongbody. He's really strong. They want to play Iron Man. They want to play the Hulk. They want to play, you know, Mystique, you know, something like that. Because it's so open-ended, people will pick a character from fiction and gives them something to work off of. And that's actually something I recommend. So the first player, I looked down at a sheet and I saw, hmm, danger sense, wall crawling, web slinging. A little super strength. We have a Spider-Man here. After him, you have uh, one of the players made a character with super strength and unbreakable skin. He had maxed out kind of the resistance in, to damage and put it onto his skin. I, I actually didn't recognize this particular character. He called him Chris Cage, and he said he was based off of Luke Cage from, from the comic book series. And, and at this point in time, the Luke Cage Marvel TV series has not come out, so I... He explains to me what the character is. I'm like, oh, okay. And it was it's a simple character. It's super strength, you know, unbreakable skin. So that was that was fairly easy to understand. Uh, then after him, uh, the last player, the last player, he asked me, oh, hey, uh, uh, Ben, uh, have you ever seen Full Metal Alchemist? And I said, yes. Why? Looked down at his sheet. He made uh, Edward Elric from the Full Metal Alchemist. So if you don't know this particular character, he had put all of his ranks into transmutation so he could shape materials into something else. And he'd also added a requirement that he had to clasp his hands together and then touch the material in order to transmute it. I believe his upper limit was he'd shape up to the size of a building. He also had a piece of the Philosopher's Stone and he was looking for a way to try and complete it. So now running down the list of backstories, we'll start with Luke Cage. He, he actually had amnesia. The, his plot line was that he woke up in the wasteland and he was just kind of dumped out there. He thinks he was like part of an experiment or something like that. Like there was some kind of scientist or research or something was done on him or maybe he was made. And he doesn't have any memories, but he was just wandering through the waste, surviving for like five months, four months. And eventually he got picked up by the technocracy and taken to a settlement they found out that he was strong. He lied. He didn't reveal that he had super strength. He just showed them that he was a strong guy and they put him to work in manual labor. But once again, he has amnesia. And so he is kind of, I guess, trying to figure out what happened to him, like why he was out there. With Spider-Man, he is a young adult. He's kind of a um, first year college kind of a person. He was from sort of a, a, a well-to-do kind of family. Not like rich per se, but they're, they're a little bit better off than a lot of other people. He had seen a lot of his friends kind of vanish. Like they, they, you know, the technocracy comes in and a few of the kids like go missing and then they don't show up. And so he had started piecing out and figuring out the technocracy was up to no good. He was doing some hero work by moonlight. He would just kind of get on his mask and he'd go out and do some superhero work and then come back. And then last, you have the Full Metal Alchemist. Uh, his story was that he was actually a member of the nobility. Where did the nobles come from? Well, way back in the day, when you had the, the war, the war between the humans and the AI, 
uh, Omnius had done this ultimatum that says, switch over to my side, come, I will give you, you know, power in the new world as if you side with me. His family had actually sided with the AI, with Omnius, and they were a valuable asset because they were scientists, they were gifted. Because of that, when Omnius took over, he gave the family kind of these cushy positions and their family had a lot of respect because they were loyal to the technocracy. Their son came into that as well. With him, he actually had a little bit of a rift between his parents because his parents were scientists and he was an alchemist. They didn't know that alchemancy actually worked. They just thought, oh, he's playing around with his this magic and science and everything. Like, it's, okay, that's cute. And he's interested in these historical books. And he had discovered something that they had missed. And he was kind of keeping it a secret from his parents that he was an alchemist. One of the things going into the story, I have to say is that the, all the players had developed their own original backstories and their own original character names. However, in this particular story, I'm only going to be referring to them by the comic book names or the anime names. So, so even though there was a character called Chris Cage, I'm actually going to refer to him as Luke Cage, which was the comic book character that was based on, because if you are familiar with Luke Cage's abilities, it helps you clarify, like, oh, yeah, he's the guy who has super the super skin and, you know... By only referring to them by one name, it helps to alleviate any kind of confusion. So that way it doesn't feel like there's more characters going around than there should. All right, so that's the, those are all the characters. Usually it's the, the character introductions are kind of the longest in this particular kind of game. Let's get into the first mission. The pitch for the first mission of the game was uh, there was a guy called Sebastian. He was a very well-to-do figure who ran a lot of underground trafficking. He collected artifacts from before the war, like VHS, coffee makers, like just mundane items. But he's just, he's fascinated with any of the before war technology. And he, and he also was a member of nobility, so he had a level of like protection because the, the technocracy believed that he was loyal to them. Sebastian had sent out some of his lackeys to a city to try and collect a relic that he was interested in. This relic was a typewriter. However, they had been gone for four days and they hadn't come back and hadn't even, like, radioed in. And it doesn't take that long to get there and come back. So Sebastian suspects that they were captured by a wasteland gang called the Slugga Boys, who had been causing problems in that particular area. What he needed was he needed people to go out into the wastelands, rescue his men, if they were still alive, and then go to the abandoned city and retrieve the typewriter. How the players got involved with this and how Sebastian came to know them... Uh, we had decided that both Spider-Man and Luke Cage had gotten into trouble with the technocracy, and Sebastian had bailed them out, so he owed them one. Luke Cage had a fight with a gang and had gotten captured by an Arbiter of Justice, which Arbiters were those things that you see in sci-fi films where they go flying around and watching over people. Spider-Man had gotten into trouble for being out after hours in an area he wasn't supposed to be. Sebastian had bailed him out for that one. With the Full Metal Alchemist, what we determined was that he was looking for information on the Philosopher's Stone, and Sebastian had found a journal which was detailing information about it. And so he said, hey, if you do, go do this mission for me, I'll give you this journal. And the alchemist said, yeah, sure. So when they go talk to the guy, he's up in this nice penthouse. And he has this mechanical servant called ZZ98. But the mechanical servant is both a helper and also a spy for the technocracy. So they can't discuss the mission while he's in the room. Sebastian leads them away and shows them to the warehouse where there are several unlisted hover bikes, as well as a secret passage that leads out of the city and under the wall. So the three leave on the hover bikes, they go under the wall and out into the wasteland. And they're leaving actually in the afternoon, kind of close to the night, because they don't want to get spotted by the technocracy. It goes from being blistering hot to cold once the sun sets. Luke Cage is fine. He spent several months wandering the waste and has unbreakable skin, so he's, he's okay. While the Alchemist and Spider-Man are pretty cold. While they're out there, the group fights some sandworms that attack them, and they also find a wrecked hover car. It's riddled with these bullet holes and stun darts and these other kind of weapons. And this is obviously, this is the group that had gotten sent out before them by Sebastian and had gotten attacked by the Slugga boys. Spider-Man is looking around, and once again, he's a tech-savvy character. He's looking through it. He pulls out, like, parts of the engine, parts of the anti-grav lift. He actually uses it and makes it into a bomb, like some kind of explosives, and he just puts it into his bag. 
What Luke Cage does is he goes, Huh, well, seems like we're gonna be having a fight with these guys sometime soon, so I'd rather just take the fight to them. Let's go to their hangout and let's beat the shit out of them. And so they're like, yeah, they go off into the mountains. He's a wastelander, so he knows about where they live. And I'm like, okay, you guys go in the general direction of where you think the Slugga Boys camp is. Roll me a percentile to see if you find it. I set the, the percentile chance at like 10%. They roll a seven, so they find it. So it's late at night. They find the camp. It's up in these mountains. There's a canyon lining kind of the walls on the sides of the canyon are these buildings and warehouses and uh, vehicle pits and stuff like that. Along the outskirts of the canyon are several watchtowers that are keeping a lookout. The group sends up Spider-Man first because he's the, he's the sneakiest character. So he goes up the wall into the watchtower and then takes out both of the guys. Once they've taken out the watchtower, Cage and the Full Metal Alchemist get up there. The Luke Cage, actually, he gets up the cliff face. He has his hands, and he just smashes his hand into the walls to bore a hole and then pulls himself up and then smashes his next hand because he has super strength and unbreakable skin. So he's kind of using his own hand as a pike or a pitten or a hammer or something. Then the Full Metal Alchemist, the way he gets up the cliff is he transmutes a ladder into the side of the face, and he just climbs up. While they're up there, the Full Metal Alchemist looks around and he says like, oh, okay, is there anything I can transmute or any kind of items in here? I said, well, there's this flammable material that's used for a signal fire. And he goes, can I transmute that into like dynamite or some kind of explosive? And I'm like, well, yeah, sure. Yeah, using it as an like explosive. So he transmutes it, it becomes an explosive. The team gets a plan together about how they're going to wreck this camp. The Full Metal Alchemist transmutes a giant rock into that boulder that you see in the Indiana Jones things, the big spherical thing. Luke Cage pushes the stone off of the cliff and it goes rolling down and starts plows through side of a building, plows through another building, goes over a bunch of cars and just keeps going down. And as the boulder is going down, Luke Cage jumps off the cliff into the camp he does the superhero landing like, and he pulls up some rebar, some metal, and he just starts wrecking buildings. He goes past a place and he's like, and he's just demolishing places. As he's doing that, of course, the alarm gets raised. The Wastelanders are pulling out their guns. They're firing it at him. Bullets are just ricocheting off of his impenetrable skin. A bunch of them are dogpiling him. And so Luke Cage just raises his arms and just throws a bunch of people off. And there's a big fight happening, and the alarm's going off. Then from the vehicle pit, there's a bunch of these like, monster trucks that come running up towards him, and they throw out these chains and are trying to grapple him. Luke Cage is like holding his grounds, and he's fighting against the chains, and he twists the chains, and he throws the, the two uh, monster trucks off the side, and they go tumbling down even farther and plow through the side of a building. It's a big fight that's going on. So this entire fight's happening. This fight is just a distraction. Because on the other side of the camp, you have Spider-Man, and he has the explosives, and he's going over towards where they think the headquarters is, the largest building, where it has a bunch of vehicles at, and he starts planting the explosives around. Once he's ready, he detonates them uh, remotely, and boom, they go off, and he just demolishes a bunch of buildings. Once Luke Cage sees that the headquarters have gotten destroyed and all these other buildings have, he's like, okay, it's time to get out of here. And the Full Metal Alchemist transmutes the cliff face into mud and just, it starts coming down and then destroys a bunch of the roads. And Luke Cage smashes into the side and causes like a little earthquake and, and a bunch of dirt comes down. And the three of them uh, run and they run and they just, they get on their bikes again and they just take off into the desert. They just get out of there. <sighs> now remember, the mission was... They were supposed to be rescuing the missing team, which was at the camp they just destroyed. So this entire big epic fight is happening. Like, ha-ha, and they destroy all these buildings, and they get on their bikes and they leave. The team's dead now. And I think that, I actually think it was a little bit of uh, miscommunication or, like, the way that he said it was, oh, I want you to rescue my missing team if they're still alive. Once again, they did have, like, they didn't find the bodies, but they found the car, and so they thought, oh, they're, they're dead now, because they, they got attacked, so, okay. And it's like, they're technically only supposed to find them 
if they're alive. Like, I want you guys to bring them back if... He, the mission was bring them back if they're alive. So the players thought they were dead. Anyway, <laughs> eh, you know, it works. Um, I, I'm actually, I'm not pissed at the players or anything like that. It's just like, oh, yeah, that works. <laughs> um, also an issue, uh, one of the characters they were supposed to be rescuing was going to be the plot hook for another mission, which can't happen now that he's dead. So that's where part of the story ended. However, the, the mission's still not over yet. The group still has to recover the typewriter from the old city. The team rides out to the ghost town, which is New Orleans, or what used to be New Orleans. Since the oceans have all dried up, the place has been overtaken by sand dunes, and several buildings are poking out from the sands. So they make it into the area, they get off their bikes, dismount, and follow the directions down several streets. However, they hear something trudging around through the streets going, oh with these large footsteps. Unfortunately, they aren't being very sneaky, and there's a deafening crash as something slams into the nearby building, causing it to collapse and throw out rubble. Luke Cage very easily blocks the rubble with his hand while Spider-Man web-slings up onto the nearby building. But the Full Metal Alchemist... <sighs> the poor Full Metal Alchemist. The building collapses on him, and a beam crushes him, breaking his spine, and kills him instantly. Once the creature is through, the two survivors can see what attacked them. It's a mutant abomination, one of the ones that wanders through the wastes in search of prey. This thing has two short stubby legs, a wooden plant-like body, and a large, long, muscular arm that's leaning on, and it's using like a wrecking ball to make attacks. And when this thing is hitting, it is just plowing through like an entire wall. The monstrosity looks around and sees Spider-Man up on the building, and makes another attack at him with his long arm. Spider-Man's like, oh crap, and he web slings up onto the next building just as the arm comes down and just caves in the entire roof. Uh, the spider kind of swings down past him and actually web slings up his legs, causing the creature to fall over, and then when he's down, Luke Cage just starts fighting him on the ground, just caves his head in with his repeated blows. Once the fight is over, the two go over to the collapsed building, because they, they didn't see the alchemist die. They just saw him get lost in the rubble as the building was collapsing. Luke Cage slowly starts pulling off parts of the wall and bits of the rubble, and eventually they pull out his mangled corpse, and where it's like his arms are broken, legs are broken, ribs are broken, just he's been crushed. And as they pull the body out, they hear a popping sound. The group sees his arm, which was broken, reform, and the bones from his caved-in chest pop back into place and his eyes open up. The Full Metal Alchemist had also put ranks into immortality as well, because he has part of the Philosopher's Stone. So if he dies, he can come back to life. And after that, the group make jokes that it's like, man, if we hadn't pulled you out of the rubble, like, we just were like, okay, he's dead, like, you would have been stuck in there. It'd be like three days from now... We'd be like, hey, whatever happened to that alchemist? And he would have, like, the rubble might have slunk off or something. But if we hadn't pulled him out of there, he'd just be stuck in the rubble. Just <laughs> He couldn't come back to life if there's still a building on him. The team eventually finds a typewriter and heads out of the city. On their way back, they get into a fight with the Slugga boys again, who are getting revenge for them attacking their camp. Luke Cage... <sighs> Luke Cage has the typewriter under his arm... And he speeds into a trap, because the Slugga boys had actually planted these um, vehicle traps. That it's like when you drive by them, they pop up and, rah, and they ensnare you. He drove into one when he has the typewriter under his arm. And he doesn't manage to hold on to the typewriter, which goes flying out of his arms and shatters. So yeah, not only did they kill the team they were supposed to be rescuing... They also destroyed the typewriter they were supposed to be getting for the Collector. The fight against the Wastelanders doesn't last very long because the Alchemist transmutes a giant hole into the Earth and sucks the Sluggo Boys' cars and trucks and all into it, closes it, burying them alive. Except for one monster truck, so that way they could use it to get back because some, some of their motorbikes were damaged. Now, at this point, Peter Parker, he goes over to the typewriter. He's like, can I still save it? And he, he had actually been collecting some parts from the city. So he's like, I can use these parts. I can get it back together and save it. And 
everyone's kind of like, oh, no, broke the typewriter. And now I'm a little bit worried since they destroyed the typewriter. The thing is open now and in pieces. And this is where the rest of the campaign I had planned gets derailed. And not for the reason you're probably thinking about. Spider-Man starts repairing it. Here's the thing. He starts fixing it up. He finds that there is something lodged inside the typewriter. It's a data disk. And the data disk looks like it's in new condition. It looks very, very recent. Definitely not as old as a typewriter. It looks like someone was hiding the data disk inside of it. Because unbeknownst to the players, they were actually being mules. This is what Sebastian was after. They weren't actually supposed to have this disc at this part in the campaign. What was supposed to happen is that they take the typewriter back to Sebastian. He opens it up and he's like, oh, there's a data disc in here. And then he can like show it to them and talk to them about it. That's going to be a plot element. But nope. Because uh, the players, since they shattered the typewriter, they found the data disc inside of it. And so now they have this disc, which they aren't supposed to have at this part in the story. So Spider-Man takes a look at it and he's like, huh, that's weird. And he pockets the data disc from the typewriter. They take it back to Sebastian, who the second he gets it, opens up the typewriter and looks inside because he thinks it has the data disc in it. He doesn't see anything. He's like, oh, huh, that's weird. Okay, and then he, he pays them the money and um, they try, the players try to sell him like other old stuff. Like, hey, we found this old timey phone and he's just not interested. It's very clear that he wanted that data disc. And the players don't tell him that they found it in them. They just kind of pocket it and like, okay, it's ours now. And so they're like, we got paid, so we're good. And he goes inside. And they split up. Now the group, the group actually goes back to Spider-Man's house. Because remember... Uh, He's actually part like computer whiz. He's similar to Peter Parker where he's like a little bit, he's good with computers. He's a smart guy. He's tech savvy. And he has his own little computer setup, which is off of the network. He still lives with his parents. So when he comes by, his parents are like, oh, look, Peter Parker, you brought friends. That's so cute. Like you haven't had friends in a while. Who are these people? Oh, hi. So, and he has them come to his room. So he puts the data disk into, into his computers. Like he's trying to figure out what's on this thing. The second he puts the data disk into his system, there's a flash of these numbers, it's like whirring, and then the entire system shuts down. And everything goes black. So the alchemist pipes up, well, it seems like you don't have a powerful enough computer. I've got a friend who's a computer expert, he has a better system, so hopefully he might be able to get some information off of it. Before they leave, guess who shows up at the door? The technocracy. Apparently, Sebastian has been arrested for crimes against the people. The technocrats talk to the group and try and get information out of them, but the players lie like a rug. Spider-Man takes the data disk and web-slings it to the wall, hiding it, so that way it doesn't get caught. Once the search is over and the technocracy leave, the group is like, well, the technocrats are after this data disk. We better get out of the city and figure out what's on here. And so they they head out to the city and and try and find um, the alchemist's friend to see if he can help them with their situation. They take the train from the city, settlement 13 to settlement 44, which is a nicer area and the alchemist's hometown, but is much more tightly controlled by the technocracy. Since the alchemist is part of the nobility, he actually has some power and is able to clear the travel with Spider-Man coming along as his assistant and Luke Cage coming along as his personal bodyguard and some help. As they're taking the train, it's this monorail that's going through the waste, traveling over the dunes, about 20 feet up from the shifting sands. Partway through the journey, the train slows down and comes to a stop in the middle of nowhere. Spider-Man's spider sense goes off and the hair stands up on his arm, so he's like, oh, we got trouble coming. He looks out over the desert to see several things burrowing through the sands and coming toward the train. The movement goes under the monorail. Shooting out from the underground are these magnetic coils attached to cables that hit the side of the train. Pulling up out of the sands are these large mechanical spiders. They're using the cables to rise up 20 feet out of the dirt and latch onto the train. The spider units were extremely large, about the size of a car. 
One of the spider's arms smashes through a window. It grabs a person and forcibly rips them out of the train. The other passengers in the train start screaming and then jump away from the window. Luke Cage grabs the mechanical arm, rips it off, and uh, pulls the person to safety. So the spiders are very obviously trying to kidnap the passengers, and the fight breaks out where Spider-Man's going around wall crawling, web slinging around the train, uh, taking care of one of the spiders. Uh, Luke Cage is fighting another, or just like breaking off its legs. And the full metal alchemist is transmuting part of the train, the wall of it, into these metal spikes that are stabbing at another spider. One of the spiders does manage to grab some people and tries to make a break for it. The full metal alchemist goes, okay, I leap out of the train and give chase. And I say, uh, are you sure you want to do that? You might take some fall damage for that. F fall damage? Why would I take fall damage? I'm just getting out of a train. And I go, well, you're not just, I mean, you're in a train, but you're also 20 feet up. And then everyone at the table goes, what? <laughs> Apparently, this was a big reveal to the players. Because it turns out that at no point during this encounter did I use the words monorail or 20 feet up. It's in my earlier description when I'd been talking to them, I just said, oh, the train is up or it's above the sands. And they're like, oh, of course it's above the sands. Like, you know, or it's like it's raised as far as, you know, a highway is above the, you know, the, the ground level. Like it's slightly raised above it. I think that's what they thought. I didn't actually name the specific numbers or talk about how it's like literally off of the ground. And so because of that, the players had thought this entire fight was happening on ground level. And so when I described these magnetic coils coming up and the spiders coming up the side and, and trying to latch onto the train, they literally thought it was just like, oh, the spiders come up like a foot or four feet or two feet or something. and. There was another, there was a scene earlier where Spider-Man had like knocked the spider and it fell off of the train and then just like got broken apart. And I think what he thought is, oh, it's at zero health. And so it hits the ground and then just breaks apart. Whereas in my head, I'm imagining it falling 20 feet, hitting the ground and then breaking from the fall. And then there was another incident, which we both misinterpreted where I had talked about, oh, Spider-Man, do you want to, like, go underneath the train? And I thought he's just going to crawl under the train. He thinks that because he thinks it's on ground level, he thinks it's only, like, there's a foot of clearance. So he's like, why would I go underneath the train? There's, like, a foot of clearance. Whereas I'm saying, like, oh, you can go underneath the tracks. And when I had said earlier they're going underneath the train, they, like, they're burrowing, yeah, but they're also going underneath as in 20 feet off, you know. So it wasn't until the Full Metal Alchemist, when he decided to leave the train, and I said, oh, you're going to take some damage if you, you know, you're going to be falling 20 feet. That was when they actually realized that they were high up. Once I explained it to them, there was a big, oh, as the players actually came to realize what was happening. <laughs> Since that day... Uh, the 20-foot train has become an inside joke in our group because sometimes the players will some will say, like, am I 20 feet up when this conversation is happening? Like, yes, you're 20 feet up. Or they'll say, like, oh, I'm going to go downstairs. And I'm like, okay, you're going to take fall damage because the stairs are 20 feet up, you know, or something. Or other times when I have to retcon a detail or I forget something, I'll say, like, oh, you guys, I got a 20-foot train here, you know, or something. There was, there was one dungeon where the players were going through it and there should have been blood splatters on the walls and stuff. Some occasional evidence that other people had gone through here that there were other uh, explorers that had hit the traps. So I had to like retcon like, oh, by the way, you guys have seen blood everywhere. Cause, and so before that, I'm like, look, I have a 20 foot train here. <laughs> Continuing the fight. Uh, the spider unit is trying to make off of the hostages. The full metal alchemist transmutes a slide pull gets to the ground and then transmutes the ground into concrete, trapping the spider's legs in the sand. He then transmutes a massive cannon and fires it, blowing the spider unit to smithereens, and it drops the uh, hostages. Off in the distance are several other spider units that were kind of waiting that retreat and just leave them because they realize they can't take this group in a fight. After the fight is over, the full metal alchemist fixes the train by transmuting the rails back together. Uh, Luke Cage decides to cover their tracks and hide that they're superheroes by yelling at people, You saw nothing! We were never here! 
Examining the robots that attack, they could see that they had the Technocratic Union logo on them, but this was an old logo from the time of the war. Now, this particular fight, one, it came out of nowhere and it was just gone. It, it, it wasn't something that re-entered back into the plot. I'll tell you what it is now. Basically, out in the waste, there was a guerrilla technocratic union group that had been fighting. Once the war was over, they had received a stop signal like, hey, the war's over, come back to, to base. And the AI thought that this was like a lie or some kind of deceptive tactics made from the allied forces or the alliance. And so this particular technocratic group was still out in the waste fighting this supposed war against, you know, humanity. They would go out and they'd collect people and interrogate them for information. And of course, all of the people they interrogated for information said, the war's over, you can stop fighting now, which they, they knew was a clue that they were clearly a spy that had been trained and given false information. And so out somewhere is this technocratic base that's fighting this imaginary war, collecting hostages and interrogating them for information, and could potentially enter back into the plot if the players were ever out in the wastes again or needed to find someone. But for now, it was just, it was one of those plot lines like, oh, you get attacked by these technocratic union, these with like these old logos, and it's really weird. And then um, for now, that was kind of the end of it. The players eventually arrive at this next settlement, Settlement 44, and this is the settlement where the alchemist is actually from. And so it's, it's a nicer area. It's a little bit more ritzy, but it's also much more tightly controlled. The players arrive at the next settlement looking for the for the computer was QWERTY, or Quark Tyrene, which that was one of our one of our players, the Luke Cage player, had actually come up with that name. I thought it was really clever. However, before they get there, out of the sewers they get attacked by these butin dogs. There's a funny moment where the dogs are not at all interested in Luke Cage or the Spider Man. They are only going for the full metal alchemist and are just trying to rip him and kill him and drag him into the sewers. These dogs are huge, they're like maybe like 250, 300 pounds, like there's huge animals and just nothing but muscle. And one of the dogs bites the full metal alchemist's leg and is pulling him into the sewers and Luke Cage has him and has got him. And so Luke Cage is super strong and the dog's really strong. And so they're just pulling on the full metal alchemist and he's like this rag doll in between them. And the, full, the alchemist says, okay, look, Cage, I'm immortal. If it comes to it, you can rip off my leg. Cage goes, okay. And he just rips his leg in half. He's like, oh, why did you do that? And he's like, well, it just, you said I could rip your leg off. And he said, I said, if it comes to it. And Cage goes, oh, well, I mean, it's, it's solve the problem. Uh, the alchemist is in agonizing pain. He lost his leg. The group does manage to fight off the mutant dogs and kill them but they have to go hide somewhere so that way the full metal alchemist can regrow his leg. So, who are the dogs? Where do they come from? Once again, another plot line which I set up, which we just did not have time to go down, was that um, the full metal alchemist, as you remember, has a philosopher's stone. He has part of a philosopher's stone. Well, there's other people out there who also have part of a philosopher's stone and they can use it to transmute living creatures and so there's someone out there who has part of the philosopher's stone who wants the alchemist's stone and so he's using his stone to make the dogs to track him down and so that was that plot line once again didn't come back to it we, we just didn't have any time it just the the dog showed up they attacked him and like wow that was really weird that plot line weren't able because this is the last session but um that's where they had come from and then we have another plot line the the technocracy come in and they investigate uh they find the dogs they find the bodies the technocracy thinks that these mutant dogs are from the quarantine zone what is the quarantine zone that's something i have not actually explained yet so remember how earlier I said that out of the settlements, all, the entire rest of the world is just a waste, just these empty, barren wastes. That's not entirely true. There's an area called the Quarantine Zone, which is the last remaining forest in the world. So what had happened is that after the war, 
the technocracy is fighting, he's killing people, and people flee into the into the woods, into the wastes. They they start using kind of like terraforming and radiation biowarfare to actually destroy the forest, destroy a lot of the resources, so that way people have to live in the cities. There was one forest in particular that it died and then would regrow and then would get hit with like nukes and weapons and would die and then regrow. And it eventually developed almost kind of this like resistance to it and and in some ways could like feed off of the radiation. The technocracy was basically trying to kill this particular forest and the forest was eventually able to fight back in, in a sense that it had be- developed this kind of immunity to its weapons. Part of it actually came from, it's a little bit based in real life in the sense that, I don't know if you guys know this story, but at Chernobyl, there's actually a fungus that is growing near kind of the um, the area where the radiation is the worst, kind of the hot areas. And the reason why it's able to do that is because it gives off this gamma radiation. There's these things called radiophiles or radiotropic fungi that can absorb gamma radiation and use them to grow. And so I had this weird sci-fi concept that there was an area that was extremely radioactive, like very, very hot. There were a series of these plants that were actually able to feed off of the radiation and actually thrive in it. There was actually a tribal group that was living in the quarantine zone and staying away from kind of the more dangerous, like the more the area where the radiation was the heaviest and kind of living out there away from technology they the people living out there were able to avoid the technocratic eye and so that was called the quarantine zone that was all the where the freakish mutants and abominations and weird stuff came that you'd see kind of wandering out in the waste and once again might come back into the campaign but you know going back to the original plot line when the Full Metal Alchemist got jumped by these mutant dogs, the technocracy thought they were from the quarantine zone. They weren't. They were actually from an alchemist. Another competing alchemist that's trying to get the Philosopher's Stone. Oh my god, my I just realized the plot line is currently just spiraling. There just there were so many like little things that um I had kind of put there and I'm like because once the players had kind of gone off on the rails, I realized that I had to sort of have, like, backup plans of, like, okay, they're going to go after this, but if they don't go after this, they'll go after this. If they don't go after this, they'll go after this, go after this. And so I just made, like, a bunch, a list of a bunch of different things that they could try and chase down. So I apologize if I'm, like, swamping you guys with secondary plot lines that uh, never kind of came back into the story. Getting back to the actual story now, they find where Cordy should be, but it turns out he's been picked up by this institute. The technocratic union has set up this institute and is collecting people they find have something interesting or unique. What they basically find out is that this institute is absorbing people into them. Once they get in, they can't get out. They're doing research on some of the students. The The group sends Spider-Man in to do some scouting and they bust out the students, Full Metal Alchemist. He transmutes a cave that kind of goes into the school underground, gets into this facility, and they're able to bust the students out. They even they even have um, Spider-Man hack into the system and change some of the data, so that way they lose information on who was special, who was not. And it's, it seems like these are students who might have had parents who were previously heroes or aliens or had some kind of unique ability and they passed it on to their kids. When I set up this scenario, I had this idea where they might have Spider-Man go into the Institute as a spy because I had put a plot thread that if you took a test and passed it, you could get admitted into the school. Originally, I put it out there because I'm like, ooh, they could do an undercover mission here. But the second I I threw it out there, they kind of played around with it, thought about it for a bit, and then vetoed it pretty quickly because they're like, Spider-Man, you know the second you go in there, you're going to become a pod person. We're going to lose contact with you. Uh, we're not going to see you again if you do that. So that idea got vetoed pretty quickly. So they got Cordy out, and it turns out he has his own, like, hacker set up. This com- he's got this little, like, secret hideaway. They're, they're staying with him, and they have the computer expert take a look at the data disk. And what they find is that what's on the data disk is it is a sentient virus. It's an AI, a virus that has artificial intelligence, AI virus. 
And what it does is it hunts down and kills other AIs. It just makes clones of itself. The idea is that you have all these different multiple AI units. It will hack into a system, and then if it sees an AI, it will override it and take it over. And it was this um, this particular virus was actually developed by the Allied Forces, the the Alliance, and they had been developing it in order to destroy the AI, in order to destroy Omnius. So they decide, hey, what if we took this and took it to the Rebellion? Because, of course, there's there's some kind of resistance force. Cordy says, like, oh, yeah, the guys need to talk to Iron Fist about that. The guy playing Luke Cage goes, what? We have to talk to the I- Iron Fist? And he says, oh, Iron Fist, you know, the, the Rebellion. That's what they're called. Out of character, the player playing Luke Cage looks at me and says, hmm, Iron Fist, like, where did you get that name from? Like, where's it Where's it from? And I, I just said, like, oh, you know, it's a, a raised fist, and it's it's a steely grasp. So I was thinking about that, you know, raised fist, that's normally a rebellion, and steely grasp, and that's, um, that's like Iron Fist, you know. And the guy playing Luke Cage starts laughing. Because remember, the Marvel TV series uh, with, like, Jessica Jones, Luke Cage and stuff hasn't come out yet. So the guy playing Luke Cage starts laughing because he's read the comic books. And he goes, oh, uh, actually, Iron Fist is a, uh, a comic book character. I'm like, oh, he is? And then the guy playing Luke Cage is like, yeah, it's he actually, Luke Cage and Iron Fist actually kind of work together. And they have a partnership because one is the ultimate shield. The other is the ultimate weapon. So it's the it's Luke Cage and the Iron Fist work together. And I'm like, oh, no. Now I have to change the name because that's all I'm going to be thinking about is that he's a comic book character. And the, the player is like, no, 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 I think that's fine. I think it's, I think it's great because Luke Cage working together with the Iron Fist, it makes, it makes perfect sense. So we kept, we kept the name, decides that they're going to go to the Iron Fist and talk to them and see if this data disk would be of any help to them and what they could do. And as they're going there and trying to find the Rebellion, that's actually where the story comes to an end that we didn't have any other sessions from there so that was the last one you know because once again it was like i was this was a series of games where i was just going by ear i'm like okay first session this was what you're doing second session this is what you're doing you know and i i never i always made sure that there were other little plot lines that it's like oh if we come back to it this is where it's gonna go but you you can see it's like I had a little bit of everything. Once they had gone off that initial plan, I sort of left it a little bit open because I didn't know if they were gonna follow the Full Metal Alchemist plot line because he's trying to get the Philosopher's Stone or if they're gonna follow more this idea of the rebellion and against the technocracy and trying to help people that they can. And that's where the story came to an end. Thanks for watching and I'll see you guys next time.